Hello, and welcome to our Mount Rainier Tahoma webinar. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jonathan Spitzer, and I'll be the host for today's webinar. Before we get going in the details of climbing Mount Rainier, I'd like to introduce you to my co-panelist, Lyra Parati. She is a senior guide for Alpine Ascents and will be walking us through the climbing route and details on the mountain. Also joining us is Bill Dunn, who is our gear and logistics team manager. Once again, my name is Jonathan Spitzer and I'm the director of operations at Alpine Ascents and senior guide. An overview for our webinar is we're gonna start by discussing our pre-trip logistics. Lyra will be giving us a detailed slideshow of climbing Mount Rainier. And after that, Bill will be outlining the gear check and rental process. Following up, we'll hit and cover some few common gear tips to help set you up for success. During our webinar, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A chat function below and you can post your questions in there. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. If your question does not get answered, please feel free to email us at climb at alpineascents.com or you can always give us a call. If you have a gear specific question, you can get, email us at gear at alpineascents.com. To get going now, we'd like to reference our home landing page for our Mount Rainier three-day climb. On the overview, you'll find details about your trip. The itinerary will cover the three-day climb. On the far right-hand side, you can click on the logistics tab. Here, we're gonna cover some key points prior to your trip. Please remember that you have a mandatory gear check at 2 p.m. the day prior to your climb. The gear check will last roughly one to one and a half hours. The gear check is a great time that where we take a look at the close we the weather, the, your equipment, and we create a plan on what kind of stuff we need to bring on the mountain up there. We'll also make sure that you have the proper food, which is the snacks for the climb. During the gear check, we'll kind of go take apart all the climbing equipment and take a close look at it. Prior to your trip coming out here, we recommend referencing these two videos, which is in the logistics tab about packing for your climb and gear there. On the mountain, you're gonna to need to bring your mountain snacks. Alpine Ascents will provide breakfast, lunch, uh, sorry, breakfast and dinner and hot drinks, and you'll wanna bring snacks. Lyra is gonna talk a bit about her favorite snacks out there, but we recommend following this outline on our page that has a sample menu here. And sample packing list for lunch out there. The next day following your gear check, we will leave Seattle at 6 a.m. from our office and drive south towards Mount Rainier. Along the way, we will stop for coffee and breakfast. As we get closer to Mount Rainier, we will enter Mount Rainier National Park, which was founded in 1899 and was the fifth national park to be established in the United States. We'll get going on the hike up towards Camp Muir, and on the mountain, we'll spend the first night at Camp Muir, which has um, pit toilets and sporadic 4G service from Verizon. You can get some messages in and out, but we would not plan on using it. The following night will be spent at Ingram Flats, which does not have toilets, and it will be using a blue bag system, which the guides will outline during the gear check and on the mountain how to use it. There is sporadic 4G service from AT&T only at this time at Ingram Flats. On the mountain, the guides will be outlining the seven principles of leave no trace during the climb, and along with more information about climbing inside Mount Rainier National Park. If you're so inclined to tip your guide afterwards, they are more than welcome to accept tips. And we've got information about um, common tipping practices in this tab here. The last thing we want to discuss is our COVID-19 protocols. We expect all climbers attending this program to be vaccinated. Those who are unable to be vaccinated must arrive with a PCR test at their gear check with no, uh, that is taken no less than 96 hours prior to their gear check. We ask that you screen yourself and you make sure that you have none of the symptoms with COVID-19. You will be required to wear a mask inside our Alpine Ascent shuttle service and in our office. If you have any questions about our COVID-19 protocols, please let us know. 
The last thing we, I'm going to talk about before Lyra takes a deep dive into the root is outlining um, the climber expectations. We expect that prior to your trip that you've spent a minimum of three months training for this. Climbing Mount Rainier is a very physical endeavor and climbers need to come with the proper fitness out there to have a safe and successful ascent. If you are not able to meet the climber fitness requirements, the guides might unfortunately have you descend early or you might be have the option to stay at camp and not climb on the upper mountain. Once again, if you have any questions, please let us know. Lyra is going to now take us through a detailed climbing, climbing overview of the mountain. Awesome, thank you, Jonathan. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, so y'all will see lovely photo of Mount Rainier here. Before we dive in, I would like to acknowledge that the land administered as Mount Rainier National Park has been since time immemorial, the ancestral homeland of the Cowlitz, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, Yakima, Coast Salish people. By following elders' instructions passed through generations, these indigenous peoples remain dedicated caretakers of this landscape. Their traditional knowledge and management of this sacred land will endure in perpetuity, and we honor each nation's traditions of landscape stewardship in our endeavors to care for, protect, and preserve the features and values of the mountain. You can find out even more from the NPS website. They have a lot of awesome history and notes for you there. And here's a little bit from our local news recently. You will hear many of the guides referring to Mount Rainier with um, its previous name, which is has some, some different pronunciations, Tacoma, Tahoma, or Tacoma. And the name means the mother of all waters. You can read an excerpt here from, from the Kiro 7 News and the last little tidbit we often find kind of amusing that um, Peter Rainier, for which the mountain was named, was a, an admiral in the British Navy who battled against the US in the Revolutionary War. War. So just kind of a fun, fun and funny fact. Here on day one, here's a photo of teams hiking up Mount Rainier, looking very summery. You'll see about four and a half miles up the snowfield and just under 5,000 feet elevation gain. So it's a good hefty day and you arrive just over 10,000 feet. On that hike, we'll pause every hour. Jonathan was just talking about snacks. We don't really take a lunch break, we, um, but we take multiple pauses for 10, 15 minutes, um, roughly every hour, hour and a half. And in that way you stay hydrated, you stay fueled. And I often like to say, we, we take maintenance breaks, we don't take rest breaks. So we keep a nice steady pace. We keep ourselves healthy and happy and just keep moving, keep that momentum and keep moving up the mountain. The Cloud Camp was the previous name for Camp Muir. And it was named, um, renamed for Muir. And another fun and funny fact was that he uh, had named that as a good place to camp because it would be sheltered from the wind. And we find often that it, it is not quite the case. <laughs> but fortunately, we have a really great shelter here called the Gambu. Named for Gambu Sherpa, who is a longtime guide and very humble. So you can see his list of accomplishments here. Just across the way, dinner will be served in a weather port. So these are temporary shelters and very, very effective uh, camp kitchen or camp mirror restaurant. This is looking back at camp mirror proper from uh, just above, just past where the weather port is. You can see very stunning and indeed just above the clouds a lot of the time. 
So after a fairly strenuous first day, we have a lovely morning, nothing, um, we're not in a rush that morning, fortunately. We can enjoy our coffee and the views. And then we dive into a few hours of snow school. So that's where we teach everybody the requisite skills with which to climb the mountain. And then we apply those skills directly as we march out of camp to our high camp, which will take roughly an hour and a half. We leave in the early afternoon. And that at that point, our focus is really to rest and regroup and mentally prepare for the summit because that is what's ahead. Here's a little more from the Traverse. This is crossing up towards high camp from Camp Muir. Crossing the Cowlitz Glacier. And then here arriving. <coughs> Excuse me. Those little tiny dots, the yellow ones, that's, that's high camp. Beautiful, some call it the most beautiful camp um, in Washington. I would, I would agree, I think it's one of them. So we march into high camp. It's already set up, which is awesome. So you'll tuck yourselves into the tents, get comfy and get busy resting. <laughs> Hopefully everyone will get some good rest. Often you won't sleep very much or very well, but so long as you're horizontal, your body gets the rest that it needs and your excitement probably makes up the rest. The climb is from there a little over 3000 feet up the cleaver. You can see the red line on this topographical map that goes from high camp up the cleaver and right into the, right into the crater of the volcano there. But the really big thing to note is look at that descent. So we descend the entire mountain back to the trailhead in that same day that we climbed to the summit. So in addition to being physically prepared and feeling strong and at, at your peak of training, it's also very important to be uh, mentally, mentally strong for that day. It's, it's a big one. Here you can see some of one of the awesome mental challenges. Things can be a little airy at times, walking across bridges, which are quite cool, really exciting. Middle of the night, it's very dark. And then we get up to the top of the cleaver. So that's a bit of a rocky scramble that you can see on the team behind this one. There may be more ladders, really quite cool. And then you'll see we'll get to enjoy the sunrise. Oops. <laughs> and here you'll see the real summit push we say is all the way back to the trailhead. So here's that red line all the way back down, right to that trailhead. And what was scenic and exhilarating and beautiful on the way up, sometimes it clicks. Just what, just what you've done, <laughs> what you have to go back, looking down at the route, and it can feel quite daunting. So that mental fortitude is what will carry you from that summit all the way back down to the trailhead and to the vehicles. So as, as you'll hear your guides say, the real summit is the parking lot. That round trip is, is what we are here to, to, to try to ensure. Thumbs up here from the guides to a swift return to high camp and then the momentum to keep on going right on downhill. before I pass it back to Jonathan here, I want to share with you this Google Earth image. This is a really fun thing to play around with. And what I've done here is queued up time of day. So with some, some mapping, I've put the, I've overlaid the route here from the trailhead up to Camp Muir here around a high camp here, 
and there's that summit summit push. But I think what can be at times the most rewarding and spectacular thing about these trips is the opportunity to climb and spend all that all that amount of time on the mountain. When we climb, we're going to climb overnight. So I'm going to go back overnight here and you can see the many moods of the mountain. And this is what one in the morning. So we'll be waking you up probably around this time. This is what the mountain's going to look like. Quite dark. And then we start climbing somewhere around here, two or three in the morning. Still dark. 4 a.m. Yep, still dark. Heading up to the top of the cleaver, probably some, oop, that, that went too fast. Somewhere around here. And those first, first rays of sun, you can see the mountain is like orange and pink, and the sunrise is just spectacular. In the morning light. And then here it's still seven in the morning. So we'll greet the sunrise from somewhere high on the mountain. And then we have a long day descending the snow field in the heat of the day. All the way down. And there we are at noon. Somewhere early afternoon back at the cars and enjoying, enjoying a nice lunch. Jonathan, I will pass right back to you. Thank you very much, Lyra. That was wonderful to see the overview of the route. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, before we pass it to Bill, who's going to talk about the rental and gear list a bit more in depth, I wanted to take this time to address a few questions. Yes, we do require a proof of vaccination at your gear check or the PCR test 96 hours prior. Um, that We do not need the actual copy. It can be a digital copy on your phone, or you can bring your copy in person. So um, people ask questions, can you leave items at Camp Muir? Yes, if you're hiking up in an approach shoe or you have extra stuff, we can leave it up at Camp Muir as well. Okay. All right. Thank you for all the questions and we'll try and address more towards the end of our webinar. Bill, please take us away with talking about the rental process. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Clara. Uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about um, what happens before you get to Mount Rainier and the, the preparation needed prior to that. Um, for most people, that's going to start with the gear list, which we have on our website. And I'm going to share my screen here and we can all take a look at that together. All right, so here we're looking at um, on the, the landing page for the three-day Mount Rainier climb. Oops. We have in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the tab here we have the gear list option and a little bit of internet lag time we get to the gear list here. Um, every item that's on this gear list is a required item to show up with at your gear check, and uh, unless it's otherwise listed as optional, which I think on this gear list is only one or two items. As you scroll through the gear list here, you can see that most of the items on the list have an option to either buy or rent. And as you work through the gear list, if you recognize items that you need, you can select either to buy it or rent it as, as you wish. Um, so we're going to work through this together. I'll just um, run through examples on how this works for both buying and for renting. Um, so I'm going to select a few items here for rental and uh, some items for purchase as well. Um, when you select an item for rental, as I just did here, you can see that that item goes to your rental basket. And when you select an item for purchase, which let's select a jacket down below here. When you select an item for purchase, you'll see that you're offered options that we have available here in the store and you can select the one that works best for you. Uh, it's important to note that the items that we have here in the store are examples of uh, items that meet the uh, requirements for this specific gear item. 
but there are other items that fulfill these needs available out on the market. Um, if, you're, if you don't like the options that we have available here for rental, each of the items here on the gear list has a description that will help guide you with uh, choices that are otherwise available out on the market. Uh, for example, looking at this insulated parka, um, talking about overall weight as a, as a measure of warmth of the jacket. Um, so if you have questions about, you know, what items, what is this? And, you know, at REI, what different items are there that fulfill this need? Uh, starting with the descriptions that we have here for each item is, is a great place to start. Um, you'll notice that there are some items on the gear list um, that we don't offer for rental, um, mostly underwear and, and base layers. Um, and um, those are available for purchase as well. Um, as you're working through the gear list here, simply select the items that you want to rent or to buy. And as you get to the bottom here, you'll see options to, um, to check out for both your rental cart and your, uh, your retail purchases. When you select for um, checking out for your rental basket, the first thing you'll need to do is enter your personal information here along with your uh, sizing information. Um, once you submit this form here with this personal information, that will get uh, attributed to your profile on the back end so that we're able to pull those rentals aside for you uh, before you arrive for your gear check. Uh, it's important to note that when you submit these rentals, uh, when you submit your rental requests here, um, you're not actually paying for the rentals. Uh, you'll pay for the rentals at the gear check um, when, when you show up and you've had a chance to try everything out. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Um, real quick note here on uh, selecting retail items. Um, when you go to check out, a couple of things that are important to mention. Number one, and most importantly here, this coupon code field. If you type the word climb in here and apply coupon, that will give you 10% off your entire purchase order. So don't forget to do that. It's a, a good benefit for all climbers who are registered for one of our climbs or courses. Um, also, you, you have two options for receiving those uh, retail purchase items. You can select shipping, which would of course ship to you at your home prior to your climb. Or if it's an item that you don't need to try on or get your hands on before you show up, um, you can always select local pickup, save a little bit of money on shipping and have those available for you when you arrive at your gear check. Right. Um, so what happens after you submit your rental items? Uh, in the days prior to your climb, we pull all rentals for your climb and prepare those, uh, pull those aside with your name on them using the height and weight information that you, um, that you entered when you submitted your rental basket. Uh, when you show up at your climb, if there are uh, sizing discrepancies or something doesn't fit quite right, uh, we can easily make those changes uh, in the moment. Uh, so what, what we're asking of all climbers is the items that you know that you need to rent, please make sure that you uh, submit those rentals before uh, one month prior to your climb. If there are items that you realize that you need last minute at your gear check, in most cases, that's not a problem. Um, but submitting the rentals for the items that you know you need really helps keep things efficient when we're here at the gear check. Um, I'd like to review just a little bit about what the gear check actually looks like. Um, stopping my screen share here. Um, when you arrive here at the building for your gear check, first thing we'll do is uh, at the front door, we'll check vaccination cards or PCR tests, and then uh, direct you to the gear check area, which we have in the courtyard here. Um, don't worry too much about how your stuff is packed when you, before you arrive at the building, because the first thing we're gonna do is dump everything out of your pack, and uh, we'll go through every item on the gear list, item by item, to make sure that uh, everybody has exactly what they'll need. Uh, at this point, we'll be trying on any rental items and exchanging for sizes uh, if necessary. A uh, quick note on the boots. Those of you who are thinking about renting boots, um, when you put in your sizing information, when you submit your rental basket, uh, just put in your street shoe size. 
And uh, we'll be sure to take all the time we need to swap out uh, a few different sizes, give you the opportunity to try on as many sizes as you need to make sure that you get boots that, that fit exactly as they should. Um, just reviewing my notes here. Um, after we go through all the items on the gear list, the guides will spend some time uh, talking about best practices for packing your bag. Um, we'll also review some leave no trace ethics and policies that uh, apply to your climb in the next couple of days and talk about uh, itinerary and logistics for the next couple of days. This whole process should take approximately an hour and a half in most cases, and then we'll be aiming to depart here by 3.30 or so, give you the opportunity to get back to your hotel room, pack your bags, and rest up uh, for an early departure the next morning. Um, just a quick note, um, as you're working through these gear lists, if you recognize that you have problems, or I'm sorry, questions that you can't answer yourself using the materials on the gear list, um, please don't hesitate to give us a call here at the office or send us an email to gear at Alpine Ascents. If you feel like you have a large number of questions or you'd like to spend a little bit more dedicated time, send us an email. We'd be happy to arrange for a gear consult. Um, but in most cases, picking up a phone or shooting us a quick email, we can address those questions pretty quickly. All right, um, thank you very much, Bill. That's really helpful. Um, appreciate all the questions that have come in so far and we'll do our best to answer that. Before we get there, Lydia and I are gonna share some common, uh, common gear things that we found out over our years of climbing on Mount Rainier. The first one is we often get questions about full side zip hard shell pants. And the reason why we require a full side zip hard shell pant is imagine that you're climbing on summit day and now you've got your boots and your crampons on and all of a sudden the weather starts to change and get quite windy or even snowing um, and we don't have often have a place where we can stop take our boots and crampons off and so that's why we need the full side zips so that way you can have your boots and crampons on and we can just unzip them and then slide um, undo the zipper slide up the hard shell pants and we can keep climbing without taking our boots and, and crampons off in the field. So that's why we, we need that, um, that full side zip pant there. One of my personal favorite gear tips out there that I use all the time is called a sunshade hoodie. It was started many years ago. We used to just recommend these generic black or base layer tops. And the sunshade hoodie material is, a lot of them are now have a built-in UV protection to it. They breathe incredibly well and the light colored with a hood helps keep the sun off us. It's quite common hiking up to Camp Muir. It can be very warm. We're in the sun most of the day as Lyra showed in her presentation and having something that breathes really well and has a hood can help keep the sun off my neck and my ears and even provides a little bit of shade to my face. So it's one of my favorite gear tips out there. Lyra, what are, um, what are some of your favorite gear tips that you found out over the years? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Those are those are some big ones. The sunshade hoodie. I feel like you can pick out a Northwest climber just by the sunshade hoodie. And there's now lots of colors and all kinds of kinds of things. Um, we we also fun little or a little nugget just about um, down insulation. Bill did a great job of lining out your resources on the website for like what what specifics in the gear are um, what things to look for and what brands and what models and things like that. And a little funny thing with down jackets is the number, the higher the number, it has to do with the quality, the weight, the um, warmth, warmth to weight ratio. And just a higher number doesn't necessarily mean it is objectively a warmer jacket. So be sure you are following those guidelines on the website. They're all lined out there carefully for you. Um, one, one of the things your guides will, will work through with you is um, how to like streamline your backpack for the ascent. If you do have your own backpack, it's great to start training with that early and get used to it. Um, your guides will be available to help you adapt to the rental bags. We're really familiar with those ones. Um, but yeah, great to get used to those and make sure that it fits you really well. Um, Jonathan, I think we're also going to chat about footwear. Yeah, that brings... Um up footwear is a very common question that we get. Often in May and June, we'll be using a double boot system. 
kind of like um, like a La Sportiva um, G2, um, G2 SM or G2 Evo, or a Scarpa 6,000 meter boot, a boot that can separate and pull apart. So you have an inner and an outer shell. Later in the season, and it really depends on the weather and what, uh, what the rate of melt that we're finding out on the mountain, but sometimes typically in early July, um, we'll switch to single boots. And there's many factors at play here when, when it switches. And the single boots is a full shank mountaineering boot, typically like a La Sportiva Nepal Evo, um, boots like that. We need the boots to be full shank. That way they're crampon compatible and need to be very warm. Even on a warm day, um, when temperatures in Seattle are in the 70s, 80s, it can be very cold up there on Mount Rainier. People ask, well, what are those contributing factors to when we switch from, from a double boot to a single boot? And one of the things that we need to look for is how deep our foot penetration is into the snow. When we're walking through a lot of wet, slushy snow, the single boots, like a single boot leather boot, tend to get saturated on day one and day two and then are, do not dry out causing our feet to be cold on summit day. So when we, once that seasonal snow shrinks down and we're walking right on the surface and combined with warm temperatures, we'll switch to a single boot. And that's typically, like I said, sometime in July out there. As your trip gets closer, you can always call and let it and ask, and we can help let you know where we're at with that. Nice. And with that, Jonathan, similar to the packs, I think training, if you're coming with your own boots, be sure you've spent some time in them working out the kinks and just making sure you're familiar with how they work. They're quite stiff. They're different. And a pro tip would be to, to actually train with them on stairs rather than on like rolling on a trail, the heel to toe rolling. That's why we request um, that y'all bring trail shoes, as we mentioned earlier. So that's a good strategy. If you're training in your own boots, try going for stairs and like see how that feels. Um, another question that people ask is like, do I really need a zero degree sleeping bag up there? And it's, it's really hard to say. The temperatures change drastically on Mount Rainier. Um, in definitely in May, June, and often all season long, we do need a zero degree sleeping bag. We're sleeping directly on the snow up at high camp in Ingram Flats. And um, sometimes a lighter bag like a 15 or 20 degree bag, you might end up sleeping very cold um, and being warm and comfortable can help create a better night's sleep and allow you to climb the next day. So we do recommend a zero degree sleeping bag up there. Lear, um, what are some kind of, of your favorite snacks um, to being on the mountain for a three day trip like this? Yeah, when we were brainstorming, like what, what, are, what are the like best gear tips? I think the most common one is to bring real food. You know, that's you don't think of food as your gear, but it really is a huge part of your, your preparedness and your fuel and your way up the mountain. When we see folks that show up with like just a, a bunch of the same thing, it's a little bit, it's, it can, that can be a lot of the same thing, like 12 cliff bars. It's like, oh gosh, that's going to be a challenge. And if you can think about it over several days, if your appetite changes in a way that you don't, aren't necessarily anticipating, that can be hard. So bring a diversity of snacks, a diversity of things, sometimes with altitude, the way that you, um, the things you that appeal to you most may change. So you can bring things like cold pizza. You, on the first day, you might bring a sandwich. Um, all kinds of like really nice treats, but be sure you have a balance of things that are salty and sweet and your favorite things, but also something that feels really healthy. Um, uh, packs of olives can be a great, a great sal salty snack. That's a pretty popular one I've seen. Um, so lots of options, get creative, keep it light, keep it compact and make sure you have enough calories. Awesome, thanks Lyra. We recommend um, referencing in the logistics tab um, some of our packing suggestions for a three-day climb out there, that we bring enough calories out there. The end goal is we really um, strongly recommend not bringing three days of bars or shop blocks out there. We want you to kind of have something that's yummy that you're looking forward to eating out there. And that way a, a balanced diet, like Lyra said, is really key out there. So um, we're gonna kind of dive into some of the questions that we have from people today. Um, Bill, somebody asked a question about um, where they're going to grab their ice axe and crampons and helmets. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, so later in the season, when we know that uh, snow conditions are 
safe to travel from the parking lot to Camp Muir uh, without the, the need of crampons and ice axes. Uh, rental crampons and ice axes and helmets will be available to pick up at Camp Muir. So later in the season, you won't need to uh, carry those rental crampons and ice axes and helmets up to Camp Muir. Early in the season, when snow conditions and weather conditions can fluctuate, we can see some really icy patches on the, the section between Paradise, the parking lot, and Camp Muir. And so during those times, we'll, we'll be keeping the rental crampons and ice axes here at the building uh, so that you can have them in your pack on the way up to Camp Muir uh, if needed to cross those icy sections. So later in the year, you know, it's hard to say, as Jonathan mentioned about foods, it's hard to say exactly when this would happen. Um, but, you know, the, the bulk of the, the middle of the summer, July and August, those crampons will most likely be available for pickup at Camp Muir. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Um, we got a question. How often do um, climbers have altitude sickness on the mountain? That's a, that's a wonderful question out there. Our three-day climb has two nights of, spent, of acclimatization built into it. So night one is at Camp Muir, which is just over 10,000 feet. We'll spend a full night there and rest and then do the mountaineering skills that Lyra outlined. And the next day, we'll move up to high camp, which is just over 11,000 feet. We do very rarely have climbers have altitude sickness, but it is, it is uncommon due to the two nights up there on the mountain. Um, let's see, some other questions. Another question we had is how do we often determine whether we, when we climb and what might cause us from not climbing on in a stormy day? So there's four weather factors that we often have um, on a mountain like Mount Rainier or other big mountains around the world. Those would be wind, temperature, precipitation, and visibility. And for us to climb to the summit of any mountain, whether it's Mount Rainier or any other large mountain around the world, we need to have, we operate in a threshold where we have, where we can be able to either see, we don't have high precipitation, very strong winds, or incredibly cold temperatures. That bandwidth, as we start to see those things increase, for example, high precipitation, very strong winds, our teams might be adjusting and looking at turning around as those conditions can promote avalanches out there. Our number one goal is to have a safe climb that is fun and rewarding while hopefully reaching the summit. But sometimes the mountain conditions do not allow us to do that. And the temperatures and conditions on Mount Rainier change drastically. That is why even if you see the forecast looks to be sunny and warm, we still need to bring all the rental items, or all, sorry, all the items on the gear list. For example, last summer, it was quite warm here in Seattle and warm at the trailhead, but we were dealing with around a 30 to 40 mile hour wind that teams were using, even when the freezing level was, was around 14,000 feet. Many people were summoning during that time period, but needed all the layers on the gear list. Let's see. Lyra, we had a question about, um, about women and bathrooms out there in the mountains. Do you, um, can you please kind of talk about maybe some tips or things like that, please? Totally, yeah, I was actually just typing a long response, but it's probably easier if I just take a moment. Um, it's a great question and the, oh gosh, many things. So I, I'm actually, an, maybe an oddball, I don't use a pee funnel, but a lot of my female colleagues do. And there, so there are ways to, with practice, kind of wrangle yourself. You don't need to take your harness off. Um, so I've obviously practiced that a lot. Um, if not, you can practice. That's the key part in your shower with, with this funnel. On the Muir Snowfield that first day, there is no privacy. You can provide your own privacy in the direction that you face, which often involves looking right at your group so that you're creating your own privacy wall. And that can be kind of intimidating. So that funnel can provide a little more privacy in that case. Some of the um, designs around it, I know people really like what's called, I think the P style, and it's a trough. Sometimes there's, you know, like a flow rate issue with some of them. So key, the key information there is to practice with it um, at home in the shower, or however you do that, and make sure that it will work for you. Um, and if not, try another style. Awesome. 
Thanks, Lyra. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question somebody asked, what are the temperatures like in, in July? And it can vary greatly here. Remember, Mount Rainier is a, um, is a volcano and very close to the Pacific Ocean. Um, the weather changes drastically. It can be somewhere between 50 to 65 degrees hiking up to Camp Muir, and it can also be stormy in July. Um, the weather is changing all the time. It is not uncommon, even in July, for us to wear um, many of the layers on our equipment list on the way up to the summit, including the puffy jacket and puffy pants up there. Even with a 14,000 foot freezing level, it takes only a 30 or 40 mile hour breeze for us to need many clothes due to the wind winds. Um, we'll take a couple other questions here. Um, Lyra, what kind of group gear do people kind of, um, can climbers expect to carry up to Camp Muir? Oh, gotcha. Gosh, so we are going to distribute a collection of food items. Um, those are, so you gotta have some room left in your backpack. Often as guides, when people show up and their backpack is completely tight and, you know, maybe you brought your own pack that doesn't have enough space for everything that um, you will have to find room for. Gosh, what would it be? Something like, oh, you can't really tell that, but a good several liters worth um, of group gear. And that's primarily going to be food. Um, what else might be going, depending on the time of year, um, we may have some other random items, but what else? What am I, what am I forgetting, Jonathan? No, that's um, pretty much it. We provide all the breakfast and dinners, all the climbing equipment is up there on the mountain. So tents are up there, our climbing ropes for the season are all up on the mountain. So we might ask you to carry a small portion of group food on, on the mountain. Typically that's gonna be um, around the volume of about two Nalgene bottles in your backpack. So we, not much more than that out there. Um, people, we have another question we just had that came in this is a great one. Um, can we expect snow at the trailhead at the start of the season? Yeah, currently right now, there's around 100 to 150 inches of snow at Paradise in places out there. And we do expect there to be snow um, at Paradise to start away probably for the first month and likely into all the way into earlier mid-June. And a lot of it just depends on what happens here in April and May with temperatures. Um, somebody asked another great question. We really appreciate these. Um, anything, um, what, what's the difference between a hard shell, hard shell and soft shell jacket? Bill, do you mind taking that, kind of explaining those two and, um, and why we need both of those in our packs? Yeah, this is a great question and a, a common one also. Um, let's start with the, the hard shell jacket. Um, hard shell, whether it's jacket or pants, is waterproof. Um, and so the primary function here is going to be protecting you from either rain or snow and keeping you dry. Um, so the higher end items are often going to be Gore-Tex layers. Um, you know, probably going to be in the $300 to $400 range. Uh, if you want to go that route and, and get a really high end Gore-Tex uh, hard shell jacket or pants, great. Um, but not, not absolutely necessary. There certainly are other waterproof options available. Um, you know, most of the major outdoor apparel manufacturers make, you know, a, a range of, um, a range of waterproof jackets and pants. Uh, often you can find either for, you know, probably 100, 150 starting and then, you know, working up to the higher end layers from there. Uh, benefits of the higher end layers is going to be durability and increased breathability. Um, but... And this aspect of breathability is kind of a good segue into talking about soft shells because a hard shell, no matter how breathable the material is or how breathable the manufacturer states that it is, it's just never gonna be as breathable as a non-waterproof layer. So a soft shell jacket and soft shell pants provide some of the same protection from uh, precipitation or snow or you know, uh, other light weather conditions that's key light weather conditions um, in that they're often DWR coded, meaning they don't absorb water, they kind of shed it, um, but they're also gonna be breathable too. So uh, imagine that you're, you're 
moving uphill, you know, high output activity uh, in some, you know, light wind or light rain or snow. Uh, so you're getting really hot. You want to be able to breathe. You want your body to be able to breathe. If it's, if you can't, and you're wearing your hard shell jacket, you're just going to get wet from the inside of the jacket with the, the condensation buildup. So having a soft shell jacket will allow you to have that protection that you need from the wind and the light rain or snow while still uh, allowing the jacket to breathe. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Um, a couple questions that have come up, which we greatly appreciate, is if one person has to be taken down um, for many reasons, they, they, they can't reach the summit, does that affect the whole group? And no, that does not. Our trips have eight climbers and four guides. And if for some reason somebody is unable to continue on up for many different reasons, um, we will continue to climb on up the mountain. So we've got lots of options on the mountain and we work with the other guide services, both RMI and IMG um, as a team to work together on the mountain. Another question that we recently, that just opened up is, how about, can you speak to early season conditions on the mountain? Typically earlier season, in May, we'll be climbing the Ingerham Direct, which from high camp, instead of wrapping out onto the Disappointment Cleaver, we'll ascend straight up the Ingerham Glacier and work with IMG and RMI, and along with the National Park Climbing Rangers to establish a route climbing the Ingerham Direct. Typically that route will stay in shape for between four to eight weeks, depending on the temperatures, freezing level, and precipitation on the mountain. We find that the Ingerham Direct is, a, um, is less mileage to the summit and easier travel than climbing on the Disappointment Cleaver when the Disappointment Cleaver is snow covered. Once the Ingerham Direct gets too broken and we can no longer have a viable route climbing the Ingerham Direct, we will switch on over to climbing the Disappointment Cleaver for the remaining part of the season out there. As far as weather in May and what people can expect, typically temperatures can be slightly colder in May and we do get sometimes of, of storms. That being said, the last two or three seasons, we've had very successful Mays with the vast majority of our trips reaching the summit and making some of the attempts. And let's see. Um, Lyra, we've got a question about the ideal um, backpack size and volume. Um, you know, what, what kind of, in your experience, do people, um, is helpful for that? Oh, good question. Because there's so many different designs. And what's the, Bill, remind me, what's the recommendation on the website? Probably four? 65 to 75 liters. 65 to 75. So that size will seem potentially for those of you with backpacking experience might seem really sizable. And the reason is that we have a lot of really puffy layers and a lot of, we wanna be sure that there's room. There is um, a lot of skill that goes into packing well so that you can carry a backpack really comfortably. What we will help you with at the high camp is, and during, during the program, is how to trim this pack that's pretty sizable down to something that carries uh, more easily on your, on your back. And that is something that modern internal frame backpacks do really, really well. So lots of strategies with that. But most importantly is that you're not like struggling with, um, with actually getting all of the things that you need for the summit day into that pack. Nice. Thank you. Um, and as a reminder, on summit day, we have the luxury of leaving a lot of things at our high camp. So I'm going to leave my sleeping bag, my little pad, um, maybe an extra snack or two, anything like that I can leave there at high camp. My extra pair of socks that I sweated in on day one can get left behind there. And we take our big backpacks and we collapse them down. So no need to bring a summit pack at all for the climb either. Okay. Um, a couple other things people asked. I'm a vegetarian. Um, do you all accommodate that? Of course. Yep. We accommodate any kind of food restrictions or dietary restrictions. Please make sure that is submitted in your application. And if it is not, please make sure you email climb at alpinescence.com with any dietary restrictions so we can make sure we have the food properly prepared for you before your trip. A um, couple more questions we're going to take today. Um, what time do we expect to get back to Seattle at the end of our trip? And um, we typically 
get back here between around 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. at night. It's a wide range of times. And on the way back, we will typically stop in either Ashford or Eatonville for a team celebration dinner outside and then come back to Seattle. We recommend making sure you do not book your flight until the following day after we return back to Seattle. Lyra, um, I know you're also a personal trainer. Um, we've got a couple questions about uh, maybe a tip or two for training. Do you mind hitting on oh. that? Gosh, yeah. Well, I, I've already tried to leak in some of my opinions in that <laughs> regard when I was talking about boots. Um, training as closely as possible to what you're going to do is critical. So when I when I talked about boots stepping on um, stairs, that's because that mimics how we create steps with that full shank boot that Jonathan was talking about. You use that stiff boot to carve a stair into the mountain, which is awesome. So appropriate for on snow. With um, otherwise training, the most important, there's lots of resources out there on your base level training. And that's really critical, having a very robust training platform to develop then strength and power from. And that ends up being something like 70 to 80% of your training hours in that first, what we call zone one. It requires time and you can't really shortcut that. And one of the things that um, people will show up having gone through a lot of like a, like a, a lot of circuit training, sometimes CrossFit makes you very durable or it can, um, but it doesn't replace that high level cardio doesn't replace the, the many, many hours that you're, you're going to need that low level cardio. And the other thing that does for you is, is elevate your recovery. So when you're stressing your recovery systems as well, that you're going to go from one day to the next, you're going to need to perform it each day. And having that base level aerobic also allows you to recover very effectively. So that's a tiny snapshot. We um, recommend following our training programs online that really hit on sports specific training. Um, so not just running, doing a combination of things out there. Lyra helped work on writing some of our training plans online. And she is also a personal tra trainer as well. Um, we're going to take just a few more questions. And once again, if we don't get to answering your question today, please give us a call or email us. Um, somebody asked, can I come by and visit the office to try on gear before buying it? Yes, please do. Um, just give us a heads up on the phone or an email and Bill and his staff can make sure that they're here to work with you all. Of course, if you purchase something online and you'd like us to ship it to you and it's not the right size, we can work with you all to get it to change, exchange it for the correct size as well out there. Um, Lyra, um, sorry, another training question. Somebody was wondering about um, best way to avoid knee pain while, while hiking downhill. Oh, goodness gracious. That is like, I literally have a blog queued um, for the Alpine Ascent's website here shortly yeah. on precisely that. I have a lot to say about it. Um, there a lot of it has to do with alignment actually and how you train your leg mechanics in addition to your strength so lots of strength training but also very intentional um, movement what often happens is people get um, hammered on the way down and that's just kind of normal your 9,000 feet down in a day is a lot your your muscles are getting loaded eccentrically if that's something that that um, makes sense to you so you're getting, you're loading the muscle as it's stretching. It's a lot of load for those muscles. The more you can do with relatively heavy weight in the gym, that can really help to prevent that kind of, or like delay that, that, um, that problem. But knee pain can often be resolved with very careful attention to just some of the smoothness of your muscles, being attentive with like massage therapy quads in particular, that helps you with your alignment. And when you have good alignment and a lot of strength in those muscles, that's gonna help you a lot. So big, big um, weighted box steps can be a great way, both going up and down. So don't skip that face. Stepping up and over a box, for example, rather than just up and back will help you. Awesome. Thanks, Lyra. It's, it's hard to really take into account, um, you know, all this stuff in a short time, but we look forward to seeing your blog post um, if you don't know, you can go to the Alpine Ascents website. On the upper right-hand side, one of the tabs says blogs, and you can find some of Lyra's blogs about training for Mount Rainier out there. Um, a couple final questions for today. Um, 
how about a, you know, a 15 degree bag plus a sleeping bag liner? Would that be okay? And once again, there's a lot of variables here. Um, one being what kind of sleeping pad system you have, when is your trip and whatnot. We really recommend a zero degree sleeping bag um, for Mount Rainier. Even though a sleeping bag liner can add a little bit of warmth, one of the best things to add warmth to your sleeping bag is by making sure that you have a winter sleeping pad, something like a down mat that has a high R value in there, can add a little bit more warmth than necessarily a sleeping bag liner out there. Our end goal is we want to make sure people have a good comfortable night's sleep so that way they're rested for the climb ahead of them. Um, um, Bill, somebody asked, um, can people leave valuables here at the office? Yeah, absolutely. Very common on all of our climbs and courses. Um, if you have things that you need to leave here, you know, whether that's a laptop or it's the bag of clothes and other items you decided not to bring after your gear check, uh, we have locked storage here at the office that so we can keep it in while you're out on the mountain, and then it'll be available to you uh, when you return after your climb. So we want to thank you all for attending today's webinar. We greatly appreciate you climbing with Alpine Ascents, and we look forward to seeing you all here. If we were not able to answer your question today, please email us at climb at alpineascents.com if it's a general question. And if you have a specific gear question, you can email us at gear at alpineascents.com. We look forward to having you here. And once again, thank you for choosing to climb with Alpine Ascents. To finish our webinar today, I'm going to show you a brief video of climbing Mount Rainier. Once again, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you this summer.